Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. Right now we've got a capture on uh, Elephant Mountain trying to remove 80 animals off an elephant and uh, translocate them down to a black gap. I like to see families spending time on the water, catching fish, having a great time. All right, we've got the temperature right where we like it. Now we're just gonna take our battered fish and put them right in the water. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. Brennan, you get a copy. Dewey, we're over here on the south side, and I've got a group of about 50 head of sheep over here. I didn't know if you wanted to come over here and classify some of these guys for the capture. Yeah, 10-4, that's probably not a bad idea. I'll head that way shortly. Okay, that's fine. I, I got another one, I think, up here. Right down here to the right, 5 o'clock. The mountain ranges out here, the views, the vistas, all that, they're great. But they're nothing if you don't have wildlife in them. I kind of have to take a deep breath. Uh, they were here way before we were. Back in the late 1800s, there was a healthy population of desert bighorn sheep across West Texas. They started to decline in the 1900s. Then they attribute that to the introduction of sheep, goats, the diseases that they carry, all this country getting fenced up and unregulated hunting. By the 1960s, all the native bighorn were gone. A group of wildlife enthusiasts, of people that love sheep and want to do good things for sheep and, and all things wild, that got together and, and said, let's do something about this. Wanting to repopulate West Texas with the desert bighorn, Texas Parks and Wildlife began capturing sheep from other states and moving them to the land they once roamed. Back in the early days, it was pretty rustic, I, I would say. And then we'd just, we'd wrestle with them a good bit. And it'd get kind of western now and then. We took three summers to catch uh, 13 prime sheep. And there were sheep brought in from Arizona, from Utah, lots of them from Nevada, even from Baja California, Mexico. The sheep are coming back uh, to Texas, and currently there's about 1,500 animals. That was a real red letter day when we suddenly saw a young lamb nursing a, a ewe on top of one of those hills. That was really the beginning of the restoration program, and, and it didn't end there. Right now, we've got a capture on uh, Elephant Mountain trying to remove 80 animals off an elephant and uh, translocate them down to a black gap. The population there hasn't really blossomed like it has at, at Elephant. Yes, sir.
So now they'll collect all the tissue samples, blood, fecal, hair, skin biopsy, uh, nasal swab, tonsil swab, checking for pathogens. We try and learn as much as we can while we have them here, We're always keeping the animal safety in, in, in mind, animal welfare in mind. The last thing we want to do is take unhealthy animals to a healthy, healthy population. And we also radio collar the animals, then we'll keep track of movements, mortalities, habitat use. The sheep are going to Black Gap, borders right up against the U.S.-Mexican border, and so a lot of these animals will likely go into Mexico, and so that's going to allow us to identify those very important travel corridors. And this guy ought to be on the landscape for eight plus years down at Black Gap, so he's got a long life ahead of him. It's because of man that, you know, that these animals went, went extinct here in Texas. So I think it's collectively, you know, our, our duty to make sure that they, that they're here for one, and they persist here for future generations. Black Gap Wildlife Management Area is part of a three million acre protected area along the U.S.-Mexico border. The canyons along the Rio Grande here are over a thousand feet high and some of the most beautiful and wild landscapes in the world. These bighorns are icons of that wildness. I've been asked, what is success? You know, when will the, will the restoration be done? And in my opinion, it's, it's never done. There's still other places within the country, or even you know, out of the country, that, that require that. That's how we started, and once we get to that point, it'll be our obligation to give back. You're doing perfect. That's the way you do it, just slow and easy. It's right where, under where my lure is, right here, look. Okay, B, hold it high and then ease down in there. There he goes, you got him. Good job. Oh, boy, you got a little baby that time. Small fry. <laughs> this is Tommy Tidwell. Good job, good job. That's a female, see, these are females out in here. He's a part-time fishing guy. You couldn't have caught the only one in there. Oh, did I? I hope nobody catches me working. He's Wally Marshall. I'm supposed to be fishing, right? Wally used to be a fishing guy. Built Ford Tough, Bass Pro Shops. Gotta get these sponsored banners out, John. Yes, something right there. This is the story of two guys with one thing in common. Well, it's a black crappie. They both mm. love crappie. Man, that's a hog right there. Yeah. This is the best right class ever. Yeah. It was cool. Yeah, hey, good deal. <laughs> when he's not out on a boat, Tommy is here in the classroom teaching ninth grade biology. Okay, everybody, time to listen up. Today, his class is studying the internal organs of animals by dissecting freshly caught crappie. Cut, cut some more of this. Go this way and cut some more of that out where you can see some more in there. Oh, man. Oh, oh just I swear. I didn't mean to hit you right there. That's the key thing, you know, to let them get hands on and see what everything looks like. Look, there's his heart right there. Look how tiny that heart is compared to his body. In the past, Tommy has bought preserved fish, but it turns out they're nowhere near as good for dissecting as the fresh ones he catches. Big female there, see? That's the kind we're looking for right there. See where it's hollow in there? Look, they really like doing this. I mean, kids that sometimes don't do much the rest of the year, when we get into dissecting, they get real excited about it. Hey, hey, look here, guys. Here's a parasite. Who's got some tweezers? Here you go. Is he moving? Yeah, he's moving. Look, guys, this parasite is still moving. Ew. Get 
game, Garrett. Come on, you got your good one. There you go. Good job. <laughs> First five seconds. Today, Tommy is still teaching, only this time it's in an outdoor classroom. He's already turning back white. After they spawn, they'll all turn the same color. They're on a lake. No textbooks, no quizzes or exams. There you go. You got your one. Just an enthusiastic neighborhood kid <laughs> named Garrett. You scared me half to death. <laughs> Can you get him off? Yeah. Uh -huh, that was easy. <laughs> Ooh. Come on. Oh, there you go. Two at a time. Look at there. There's one. There you go, Garrett. <laughs> Get in, Garrett. Oh, crap. Oh, you missed him. Oh, that was a good one. It's a catfish. Get in here and check something here. See those sticks right there, Garrett? When I get up there, you drop it right down in those sticks. There you go, perfect. Now be ready, he'll get it. Crappie is a good fish to start kids out on too because you can catch a lot of them and the fish, even small ones, they're fun to catch. <laughs> Good job, good job. I could have lost him. Did you reel? No. Don't reel. They were building the lake at the time we were kids, and you know, every weekend we were out here camped out. Our parents, they didn't worry where we were at. Giddy. Naughty fishy. <laughs> they knew we were out here on the lake fishing and camping. There's a good tree right there, be ready. I can take a lot of husbands and take their wives out here and I tell them, put their wife next to me and I'll make sure she can catch more fish than you do. <laughs> and a lot of the husbands, they're happy. When, when the wife's happy, the husband's happy. First of all, about that name. It may read like crappy, but you'd be wrong. <laughs> It's actually pronounced crappie. Hooray! Crappie comes from the word crepe, a French pancake that's flat, just like the fish. It's also the third most popular catch in Texas, just behind largemouth bass and catfish. Oh yeah, we got a lot of crappie. And like many other sport fish, crappie doesn't just appear out of nowhere. Biologists like Greg Benyon very carefully monitor the species. White crappie. What we're recording right now. 255. Is length. 47. And we're also getting a weight in grams. We can compare that year to year and get an idea if the population may have increased since the last survey or it's actually declined in abundance. Black crappie, 251. Are they good eating fish? Excellent. In my opinion, one of the best freshwater fish to eat. So thanks to folks like Greg, we have enough of these tasty fillets to go around. Yay! Woo! <laughs> it's gonna be a beautiful morning, you know, it's rained all last night, yeah. so I think I'm gonna leave a little opening. Where's that coffee pot at? Where's your blade at? It's something you gotta do, man. Biggest fish of the tournament, what's your guess? About two and a half. That's all. Two and a half pounds. Drop your fish right in here, buddy. This is the Mr. Crappie Big Crappie Classic. All right, young man, what's your name? It's a once a year, everybody wins, family-friendly fishing tournament. I don't have a boat, I don't know where to go. Okay, you're gonna fish from the bank. You wanna fish from the shore? Yes, sir. There's a walkway that goes out. And this is Mr. Crappie himself. And so just cast out past it and just do a slow retrieve, okay? He's also known as Wally Marshall. Just work that bank line right there and you'll catch some fish. All right, thank you, Mr. Marshall. Hey, thank you, buddy. Hey, catch a big one. I will. All right. Wally adopted the Mr. Crappie moniker back in 1996 and went on to make a name for himself with a complete line of Mr. Crappie products. Why do I do this? It's because I like to see families spending time on the water catching fish, having a great time. We just getting cranked up. There comes a family right there. Fish. Families like the Russells. <laughs> There's Robert, his brother, Kenneth. OK, Dad, ready? And their three kids. Let me see you in a minute. They've fished this tournament since they were tadpoles. 
That is one big fish. <laughs> She's Alexis. <laughs> He's Weldon, and this... Oh, Guapi! Guapi! ...is Cody. Aw! It got it away. Ugh. I said, you ready to go fishing? And they're like, let's go. I almost caught that big one. Anytime they can go fishing, they're happy. Bring him up. Oh, my gosh. There, yeah, there you go. Good girl. It's heavy. <laughs> She's a fishing fool. Whoa! Big fish! Big fish! Oh, you got off again. Oh! Me! Mom said it was too early to get up, so she didn't come out. <laughs> There's a fish. Really? Really? Oh, all right. Oh, stop. <laughs> Good grief. Hold this one. This is the greatest fishing partner in the world. Same thing my dad did with me and the same thing he did with my brother. He uh, took us fishing. That was the best time when we went out with him. Where in the mouth? <laughs> we got a lot of fish. Did you get one, Cody? Fish! Okay, fish. I got one. Finally, Cody gets a fish. There you go. Yeah. And all is right with the world. Now, good job, Cody. I want to commend you today for bringing the children out to the tournament. Cody Russell, put him in there, buddy. Woo, he's a live one. It doesn't really matter if you're a showman like Wally Marshall. 1.05, way to go, young man. Or if you're more of a teacher and mentor. Come on, Garrett. Like Tommy Tidwell. He's black too, see, that's a little male. Looks like it's about 10 inches. All right, brother. When you have a love and a passion for something, you just really want to share it. It's just a thrill to see families out on the lake. There you go. The fish is a bonus, actually. But spending time in the outdoors is really what it's all about. You came untied. I'm sorry, buddy. It's OK. Accident happened. <laughs> Hey folks, uh, this is Tim Spice with Texas Parks and Wildlife. We're here at McKinney Falls State Park and we've got some fresh crappie here from uh, Granger Lake, a few miles up the road. We're going to show you how to uh, take your catch from the day and fry it up nice and easy and have a great meal for you and your family. To prepare the fish, first I, I've taken it out of its container and we've dried it off a little bit. We're going to lightly prep it with some, uh, a little bit of salt and a little bit of fresh pepper. All right, just a little bit of pepper though, because uh, crappie's a really nice, delicate fish and you don't want to overpower it. I was raised with just a simple cornmeal batter. You can do a little thicker if you like with an egg wash or even a little bit of uh, milk or uh, buttermilk. But this is pretty simple. You'll get a great fish flavor just this way. All right, we've got the temperature right where we like it, about between 250 and 275. Now we're just gonna take our battered fish and put them right in the oil. Watch your fingers so you don't splatter that hot grease. We want to cook the crappie for about two minutes on each side. Nice light brown and keep it nice, moist, and tender on the inside. That's the best way to eat it. All right, these look good. These are done. We're going to put them all on the plate here for everybody. If you want to know how your fish are done, here's a simple test. Take a fork, and if you can break apart the flakes, that means your fish is done. Here's a raw fish, and you can see I can't pull the flakes apart. When the flakes break apart, your fish is done. Now we're gonna cook this lighter method where we've got the fillets. We won't bread them. We're going to take a little fresh tarragon. We're gonna rub it into the fish, and then we're gonna take a little lemon, and we're just gonna squeeze it onto the fish here. Now we're ready to put it on the pan. First off, we're gonna have a little bit of olive oil to help keep it from sticking in. It adds some great flavor. And then we're gonna take those fillets that we uh, put the tarragon on and put them straight on the pan. Great little sizzle, that means that pan's hot. It will, again, just like the other fish, it'll only take a couple of minutes on each side. I picked a shallow pan so that I can get my spatula in there a little easier. Now those fillets are very delicate, so you have to be careful when you turn them or they'll fall apart on you. That tarragon and that lemon, I can smell it right now, really great flavor coming through on that fish. It doesn't take but less than a minute if, the, if your pan's hot. 
Fishing is a great family activity and preparing a great meal for your whole family in one of our great state parks is something that we'd love for you to do. We've got two kinds of fish here, prepped a little coleslaw and some hush puppies and you know what? I think it's about time to sit down and dig in. You guys ready to eat? Yeah. Long before humans made their mark on the land, the Rio Grande River was shaping Resaca de la Palma State Park. Ancient coils of riverbed, known as Resacas, would ebb and flow, creating a home for a menagerie of wildlife. <laughs> There's a little hole right through here. <laughs> I'm fixing to stop right up here and let y'all walk the rest of the way. This is a fine trail for seeing Mexican blue wing butterflies. Now the challenge out here is to separate the other bird calls from the chachalacas. Oh I see this area more of a, a treasure. They're still in the branches. Because bronzel is growing so rapidly, it's going to be sort of urbanized. This is going to be one of the few places that they're going to be able to enjoy the outdoors. It's straight ahead. And that was kind of like the idea of the, of the World Birding Center complex, is to create this wildlife corridor uh, all throughout the valley. This corridor represents a convergence of two major flyways with over 500 species of birds, served by a series of locations throughout the Rio Grande Valley, collectively known as the World Birding Center Network. The Altamira Oriole, the one that everybody saw. This region is connected not just geographically, but in the virtual world as well. Altamira Oriole would actually be one of the ones. We just mapped it here, here, and here as well. If you tell it to play a sound. Pretty common song that we heard this morning. We have a really cool way of keeping our visitors informed. So what we do is we use our Facebook. The visitors love it because they get to look at our photo album and, and see how much fun we have, what they can expect when they come here. This really, really says what Rosaka de la Palma is all about. Down, it's, it's down, it's ahead, it's straight ahead. Ah, right up on top, that's our mockingbird, absolutely. It's always rewarding for us to see families come to the park and be excited about what they see. We have a healthy population of different animals. Each has established its own range. They're happy, there's enough food, water, shelter. They're happy, you know, and if they're happy, we're happy, you know, that's bottom line. Thank you. 